Welcome, and thank you for joining us for today's TechSoup for Libraries webinar, Digital Literacy Training Tutorials for Libraries. My name is Crystal, and I'll be your host. We have two guests today who will talk about some free digital literacy resources that you can integrate into your library's services and programming. And they'll also share some ideas and examples of how libraries are using these tutorials in unique and innovative ways to help improve digital literacy in their community. But before we begin, I have just a few announcements to share. We'll be using the ReadyTalk platform for our meeting today. Please use the chat in the lower left corner to send questions and comments to the presenters. We will track your questions throughout the webinar and will answer them at the designated Q&A section at the end of each presenter's section. All of your chat comments will only come to the presenters, but if you have comments or ideas to share, we will forward them back out with the entire group. You don't need to raise your hand to ask a question. Simply type it into the chat box. Should you get disconnected during the webinar, you can reconnect using the same link in your confirmation email. You should be hearing the conference audio through your computer speakers, but if your audio connection is unclear, you can dial in using the phone number in your confirmation email. And if you're having technical issues, please send us a chat message and we will try to assist you. This webinar is being recorded and will be archived on the TechSoup website. If you're called away from the webinar or if you have connection issues, you can watch a full recording of the webinar later. You will receive an archive email within about two days that will include a link to the recording, the PowerPoint slides, and any additional links or resources shared during the session. If you're tweeting this webinar, please use the hashtag TS4LIBS. We have someone from TechSoup live tweeting this event, so please join us in the conversation there. TechSoup Global is dedicated to serving the world's nonprofit organizations and libraries. TechSoup was founded in 1987 with a global network of partners. We connect libraries and nonprofits to technology, resources, and support so that you can operate at your full potential, more effectively deliver programs and services, and better achieve your missions. TechSoup has distributed over 14 million software and hardware donations to date through our product donation program. And we offer a wide range of software, hardware, and services, including software like Microsoft Office and refurbished computers. For more information about TechSoup product donations or services, please visit TechSoup.org and click on Get Products and Services. All right, so once again, thank you for joining us for today's webinar, Digital Literacy Training Tutorials for Libraries. We have two guests joining us today. Scott Allen joins us from Chicago, Illinois, where he is a program manager for the Public Library Association. Scott oversees the DigitalLearn.org project, a free resource for libraries that includes self-directed tutorials that teach basic computer skills. Jessica Rich joins us from Raleigh, North Carolina, where she is the Curriculum Coordinator for GCFLearnFree.org, a website that teaches essential skills from work and career to technology through free multimedia course content. My name is Crystal Schimpf, and I'll be your host for today's webinar. Assisting us with chat and Twitter, we have Ginny Meese and Becky Wiegand from the TechSoup team. We'll be on Twitter using the at TechSoup for Libs handle. We'll have time for questions throughout the webinar, so please send in your questions as they arise, and we'll keep track of them. Now we'll start off today by hearing from Scott about the DigitalLearn.org project. He will give us an overview of what's available, updates on new features and courses, and we'll share some innovative ideas for how libraries are integrating digital learn into their programming. Then Jessica will join us to talk about GCFLearnFree.org, and she will give an overview of what's available, highlight some of the course topics that will be of great interest to libraries, and share some examples of libraries using GCF Learn Free to support technology instruction for their patrons. We'll have time for questions after each speaker, so again, please send in your questions as they arise. Now, most public libraries in the United States are offering some form of digital literacy training and assistance to patrons, whether in formal settings like computer classes or in more casual settings like drop-in computer lab assistance, tutoring, and one-on-one -on -one help. Even reference questions can contain elements of technology and digital literacy, and most libraries provide a wide range of resources to help library patrons learn technology. And I know also some nonprofits who may be joining us are offering digital literacy training as well. Now we'd like to know, 
what, which of these activities you're directly involved in providing at your library, meaning that you do them as part of your job or volunteer role. So please select up to three of these, the top three that apply to your job role by clicking the radio button and then clicking Submit. And once you've submitted your response, then you'll see a summary of what everyone else has responded. Um, of everyone else's responses. Now also if you have any specific ideas you'd like to share at this point of how you're providing digital literacy training, you can share those in the chat and we're happy to share them out um, as we are able to. And so we just want to get a sense for what the most popular activities are and what your experience levels are um, in, your, uh, in your library or in your nonprofit as it may be. So selecting the top three and then clicking Submit. Looks like we're getting quite a few responses at this point. And definitely technology reference questions is what we're seeing as the most popular. So uh, people coming in and just asking questions about help with technology, helping them at that point of need. Uh, Drop-in assistance uh, is also very popular. And providing training resources is the third most popular that I'm seeing right now. Now we'll give just a few more seconds for you to respond if you're still taking a look at those responses and thinking about it. Um, so we'll close the poll. We'll give a countdown here in 3, 2, and 1. And it looks like we got just a few responses in here right at the very end of that. So yeah, pretty much the same. Uh, some of you are definitely offering public computer classes and tutoring appointments as well. So it's great to see a variety of activities being offered here. Um, now another thing we would uh, just like to know is how familiar you are with the resources that we're sharing today. We're starting off with DigitalLearn.org. So tell us, uh, are you familiar with Digital Learn? Have you used it as a resource uh, prior to, today, to, to today's webinar? Were you familiar with it but never used it before? Or is it a new resource for you, not aware of it? And taking a look at those results, so I can see a lot of you are new to this resource, which is great to hear. We're happy to introduce something new. And uh, again, it is a free resource that you're able to use, so we're happy to introduce that to you. Um, for those of you who have used it before or who are familiar, I hope you do get some new ideas from Scott who's going to share this with us in just a minute uh, on how you might be able to do uh, something different with Digital Learn than what you're uh, currently aware of. So hopefully you get some new ideas as well. We're going to close this poll in just another few seconds here so everyone gets a chance to respond in 3, 2, and 1. All right. Well, uh, you've come to the right place if you're here to learn about Digital Learn, and that's what Scott's about to tell us right now. So I'm going to turn over the controls, and Scott's going to tell us how we can use this tool in our libraries. Scott? Thank you very much, Crystal. And thanks to TechSoup for inviting us to be part of this webinar. Uh, Public Library Association is very proud of Digital Learn, and it's exciting for us to be able to share it with all of the public library staff and others who are on the webinar and, and to be able to talk about some of the features. So as Crystal mentioned, I'm going to talk a little bit about the history and what the uh, website offers now, but then also talk about some new features we'll be building out this year that I think will be very much of interest to public libraries and their patrons. A little bit about the history. PLA received an IMLS grant, Institute of Museum and Library Services grant, in the fall of 2012. Uh, we consulted our public library members uh, about what they needed and what their patrons needed in terms of digital literacy training to make sure that it would meet the educational needs and literacy levels of the learners and that the length of the courses would be appropriate and that it would really work into the flow of a public library. We hired Anil out of Denver to develop the strategy and manage the technology. And we hired Kixel, a training and instructional design firm, to develop the courses. And we launched them in the summer of 2013. Uh, what became the first set of 14 courses was up in 2013. And then in 2014, we added a second feature, which is essentially a community of practice for digital literacy trainers to be able to share information. Uh, last year, in 2015, we brought on some new funding partners and we started developing some exciting new features, which I'll be talking about momentarily. Our partners in Digital Learn include IMLS, but also two ALA offices, the Office for Information Technology Policy and the Office for Diversity, Literacy, and Outreach Services. The Chief Officers of State Library Agencies has been a partner since we started the project. And just last year, Chicago Public Library joined to help us build out some exciting new features. So what is Digital Learn? I'm excited to see that a lot of people on the webinar are not familiar with it, so this will be new information. And hopefully after the webinar, you'll be able to go on and play with the site and use it yourself. 
there's really two segments to Digital Learn. I'm going to start with the Community of Practice um, segment. When you go to the landing page, you'll see a link to say Help Learners, and that's intended for anyone who is a digital literacy trainer or just happens to have to do digital literacy training as part of their job to go to get resources. It's essentially a site where people can post and share information. You can learn about upcoming events that might help you uh, develop your digital literacy training skills. Uh, and it, it's really just, just taking off now. We had about 10,000 registered users as of the end of last year. Uh, and then we took the site down and just put up a new version that will allow users to share uh, materials much more easily. Um, so hopefully if, you, if you're interested, you should log on, sign up, and start to peruse what's being shared on the Community of Practice site. But the main feature in Digital Learn are the courses for learners. Uh, what you see on the screen right now is the home page. Um, we have changed it recently so that you go directly to see the courses that are available when you go to digitallearn.org. And we have 14 courses on the site right now. Um, and you'll see a short introduction to each and links to go to the various modules when you go to the home page. Here's an example of a learner module. This is the intro to email course. Each course is 6 to 22 minutes. We intentionally kept them short. And it's broken up into modules, um, again, short modules, because we knew that's what's going to work best in a library setting or other settings where people can't sit down for a long period of time to really dive into something. We kept the reading grade level at fourth grade for all these courses. There are some exceptions. Some computer terms do not go below the sixth grade reading level. And we also made these courses as mobile friendly as possible, but then there are some features in the courses such as how to use a mouse that really don't work on a mobile device. When a learner opens the module, they'll clearly see how many lessons there are, what they cover, and how long they are. And each lesson within the module is a video with narration. You can also access a course transcript of each as a PDF that has the entire text of the course. And then later this year we'll be adding subtitles to the courses so that people can read the screen if they can't use headphones or play the speakers. So as I mentioned, we have 14 modules up on this, the site right now. Uh, we intentionally started with very basic critical skills because we know these are entry points for using a computer. And when a patron comes into your library, for instance, and says, I need to apply for a job online, and you start to help them, sometimes they, you realize they don't really know how to even go online. They don't have an email address. They don't know how to use a computer. So the intent behind Digital Learn was to give them those basic critical skills that help them get to the next level and do what they need to do online. You'll see I've included the specific lessons under two of the modules to, again, give you a sense of how it's broken up and how short they are. Um, we've also found in our data that a lot of users will complete a lesson, a module, and then go back and repeat a lesson like the mouse repeatedly four or five times to be able to really hone in on that skill. Um, so that's how we've broken up these courses. We know we're meeting a critical need. In the first year, the site exceeded our estimates and we had over 36,000 visitors who completed about 6,000 classes. And then since January 2015, we've had another 16,000 classes completed. The most popular classes have been getting started on a computer, using a PC, intro to email, basic search, and navigating a website. Now I'm going to talk a little bit about some new features that we're rolling out in 2016. Uh, first, we've benefited a lot from the libraries that are using Digital Learn and the patrons who are using it to get ideas for new topics, what are the new things that they want to see on the site. So this year we're hoping to develop five or six new modules at least, and we already have a few in development. Those modules will cover uh, safety and security, things like logging in, passwords, scams, and phishing. And we also have a module which is somewhat unique. It's about addressing fears of using computers and using the Internet. Um, we heard a lot of feedback from our, our library, public library members and staff that a lot of users come in and, and are initially just nervous and scared about what they can and can't do on a computer. So even though we're not teaching a, a skill in terms of how to use the computer, we're, we're giving them information that will help them overcome those fears and get started. So that will be a new course we roll out this year. 
another exciting thing we're doing this year is translating all of the courses to Spanish. We know how important it is to have things in other languages so that you can serve all your patrons. Right now on the site, two of the 14 classes are in Spanish, and there's a toggle to go from English to Spanish. So a Spanish user would see all of the site content plus these two courses. But by the summer this year, all 14 of the modules that are on the site will be translated, and so the site will essentially be a mirror image in Spanish. Another new feature we just added um, is the ability to log in. Initially, Digital Learn was an open website that didn't require logging in. We knew that that was a barrier for some of these learners who don't have a lot of skill. Um, so we didn't want to make it any more challenging for them to get to that first level of content. But we've also heard from libraries that a lot of users, once they start learning, want to be able to keep track of what they've done and go back to where they left off. Um, so we did create a login screen, which is accessible from the home page. But you'll notice in keeping the focus on the target audience of those with very low digital literacy skills, we've done a few things that aren't typical. An email address is required to create this account, just like you would expect, but we know a lot of these users don't have email. And so right below the email box, there's a link to the course about how to set up an email address. We also don't ask for much information because we see that as a barrier to getting started. And the passwords can be anything. There are no um, requirements in terms of letters, numbers, or special symbols. And it also shows the password when they type it in, as opposed to having it hidden, because we think these users probably benefit from seeing it. They might not be the best typist. They need to make sure they've got the exact letters the way they want them. Um, so that's just a little bit different, but we, we know our audience here. So those are some new features we're starting. Um, and I just want to talk a little bit now about how libraries are using Digital Learn or how they might use Digital Learn and then give some specific examples. So first, we hope that your public libraries or other community agencies that might be on the webinar today will link to the site from their library computers or from their library website and direct users there uh, to help them develop digital literacy skills. We also think it's important to educate the library staff that Digital Learn is a resource that's out there and that they can refer patrons to, to it who have, who have training needs. And we have flyers that PLA, the Public Library Association, can send you that include space for personalization. So you can put your library or your branch name in the box. Uh, there's an image on the screen right now of a flyer. And you can put the address or you can say, see Becky at the reference desk for help getting to Digital Learn, whatever you think is the most useful uh, information to help patrons uh, get to Digital Learn. We also would like to see Digital Learn promoted at the state and, and library system level, um, promoted to member libraries. Uh, we also encourage uh, libraries and state library agencies to identify staff who are either digital literacy trainers or just have that responsibility on them day to day because of patron requests and encourage them to join the community of practice because they will learn from each other. We've also heard from some libraries that Digital Learn has helped use them do staff and volunteer training. Um, a lot of staff, of course, come with these skills, but if you have volunteers or staff who didn't really uh, learn computer and Internet skills, um, Digital Learn can help them get started. In Alaska, the rural library IT aides uh, were required to complete Digital Learn courses as a hiring prerequisite. Um, the Alaska State Library decided to give all librarians in the state a detailed training through digitallearn.org. We also would love to hear from you about uh, what you want to see in the training content. Again, we are trying to be at a lower level than some other training resources, but we still think there's quite a bit we could build out to help people get started. Now I'd like to cover a few examples of how libraries are using Digital Learn. Um, the St. Paul Public Library is actually this resource, uh, this, the site that gets the most referrals to Digital Learn when we look at our data, and we wanted to know why, so we talked to them. And this is a little bit about how they ended up using some of the modules and lessons in Digital Learn. In 2010, the St. Paul Public Library and many other community partners participated in a process to determine how to best assess and quantify digital literacy knowledge among lower skilled adults. Um, the meaning was, the intent behind this was to help employers and job seekers. And through this process, they developed the North Star Digital Literacy Standards, which are online at digitalliteracyassessment.org. 
once those standards were developed, they wanted to help patrons and other community members make progress. Um, so the library set up a website that links these standards to digital literacy training resources. And as you can see by the arrows on the screen, some of those specific learning resources are digital learn lessons or modules. Some of these even link into the specific lesson within a module because that's what met the needs of the library and their community. So we really appreciate St. Paul Public Library finding this creative way to use the digital learn training modules. Another example I want to share that's leading to some of the most exciting developments with digital learn is the Chicago Public Library. In January 2014, Chicago Public Library embarked on a process to collect and review ideas for how it could help advance workforce development efforts in the city. They assembled a lot of local stakeholders, including city colleges, public schools, the Chicago Jobs Council, and others. And together, they planned a phased approach to determine how the library could help Chicago citizens achieve, achieve digital proficiency, which would then in turn help lead them to productive employment. They began piloting a digital literacy initiative in their branches using staff that they have in the branches to help with training. Um, and after about 100,000 sessions with patrons, they realized that the, the staff in the branches needed a more consistent uh, training curricula. And they'd been working with a whole range of resources, including Digital Learn. They hired a consultant to identify the digital literacy training materials. And they, that consultant identified 36 resources and ultimately boiled it down to three that they thought would meet the library's needs for this, this engagement. One of those was Digital Learn. And so they approached the Public Library Association asking if we would be willing to work with them on some new features that would make Digital Learn exactly what they need for their initiative. So that's led to some really exciting site customization work that we're doing initially with the Chicago Public Library, but that will be available to libraries across the country later this year. So we've, allowed, we've developed features that will allow learners to log in and save their progress, to receive certificates and go back and find those certificates if they need them, for instance, for a job interview or for some meeting with a social service agency. They can use a course recommendation tool that I'll show you momentarily to help them figure out which courses they need based on what their goal is in using a computer. And then they can get a custom course list and work through it uh, in a progression in order to meet their goals. For the library end, Chicago Public Library and soon other libraries and organizations can add custom content to the site. They can pick and choose from what we have with Digital Learn, or they can build their own courses. They can make custom page content. So when a learner finishes a course in the Chicago Public Library site, they might get an instruction to go work with a local agency on their resume or do something specific that's community-based. The libraries also get user analytics. And they also have the ability to co-brand the site with their logo, um, so, which shows the community and local stakeholders like the Chicago Jobs Council and funders that they're providing a critical service here in the city of Chicago. So just quickly, I want to review some of the new screens we've developed uh, for the Chicago Public Library, which will be available to other libraries once we roll out later this year. Uh, when a user first creates an account, a wizard walks them through these questions about what they want to do, and then recommends some courses depending on their goals. You can see that it asks about their current comfort level and what they want to do with the computer. The questions on the screen you see right now are all on the screen. In the wizard, it gives them one question at a time because we think that that's probably easier for some of these users to, to go through. Once they've completed the wizard, they'll get a plan, and it will pull courses from the existing courses to help them meet their goals. So in this case, you can see the user has gotten basic search, intro to email. They've completed basic search, and they're a third of the way through intro to email. and then they may be able to add more courses by retaking the quiz or by simply starting a course. Once they start a course, it gets added to their plan. They also see in their account which courses they've completed and when. And as I mentioned earlier, they can download the certificate again if they need to for a certain purpose. That's the learner perspective for the library perspective or the administrator perspective, you can just see how simple we've made it for the library to add courses. So here is the administrative dashboard where they can 
pick different courses, publish them, uh, review them, change terms, change titles, um, add a new course if it's something that either Digital Learn has developed or that the library has developed themselves that they want to put on the site. On this next screen, I'm just showing quickly how you can uh, add supplemental materials. As I mentioned earlier, once a user finishes a module in Digital Learn, they can then take direction from the library or the other agency that's working with the library in terms of what to do next, to build on those skills, to seek employment, to use, a, use the city or school website uh, for their child education, anything that the city and the library decide together that they want users to be doing with those skills can go into these uh, post-course completion areas. And again, this is just another sc screen in the back end for the administrators about adding a course. And this would be if, for instance, the library or library system wanted to develop a course on how to use the local school system's parent portal. So we know we have um, children in school and their parents may not be as comfortable with computers. They can learn basic skills, but maybe they would need a separate course specifically on what the school's parent portal offers and how to make the most of those features. So that might be something a local library develops and uploads to Digital Learn so it shows up for their patrons. And with that, um, I've covered what Digital Learn is currently and also what we're hoping to turn it into this year. And uh, hopefully it meets some of your needs now and that you'll be willing to work with PLA in the future to help develop your own customized sites. Great. Well, Scott, thank you for sharing uh, so much about what Digital Learn has to offer. And what I want to, we've had a lot of great questions come in, and I want to go back towards the beginning of your presentation to where you were talking about the way Digital Learn is now and the way that it's openly available to all um, uh, libraries, uh, not about the custom uh, part of it. So, because uh, we had some questions about the new login feature, um, and just to clarify, is login required for users going into digitallearn.org as it is now? No. As when you go to the digitallearn.org homepage, what you see is all of the courses, and you can start one immediately. You, there's no need to log in, uh, but there is a button to allow a learner to log in and create an account. Great, great. And then you know, what are the benefits then of signing up and logging in um, for users? That wasn't, uh, if you could just go back and touch on that. Sure. Well, we've heard from some of our live public library members and library staff who are working with these patrons that users will come in and they, they'll know they did some courses, but they weren't sure which ones, or um, they, they want to be able, or they did a course and now they want to prove to someone that they're talking to outside the library that they've done that course. So we added the Create an Account feature to enable them to track what they've done, to go back and get their certificate of courses they've completed. Um, just a, just a, another way to add some features for users who are maybe more con consistent and routine, uh, but a user who simply wants to do one module and move on is still able to do that without creating an account. Great. And then also related to account creation, if they are creating an account but they don't see a library listed or they're not joining from a library site, can they skip that part of the registration process? Yes, they certainly can. Great. All right. Um, and then a few questions came in about the course content and the language. Uh, I know you indicated that they are being translated into Spanish, um, but are, they, uh, are there plans to translate the courses into any other languages? And the specific languages mentioned were French, Arabic, and Vietnamese. I'm sure there are others as well. <laughs> and, you know, we're so proud to finally get the Spanish translations um, done, and we know how important those are. Um, that we would love to keep doing more, but at the, at the moment we don't have the time or resources or skills to do that. We do would welcome partners, especially libraries in communities uh, with those, a lot of speakers of those languages who have staff who might have skills to help us get the translations done. We would love the site to have more translations, but right now the only plan is to do the Spanish. Okay. Um, now in terms of the uh, 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 additional courses that are being developed. You mentioned a few of them. Is there anywhere where there's a list of upcoming courses? Um, and also, are libraries able to request courses or provide feedback on what topics they'd like to see? Uh, we don't actually have a list out. We had about 15 topics that we um, 
rotated through some of our member volunteers, some libraries using Digital Learn, and some digital literacy trainers, and they helped us pick the next five or so that we're going forward with. We would love, if my email is on the screen, I would love to hear from you all uh, what are the courses you want to see um, on Digital Learn or another digital literacy training resource. We'd love to help find them if it's already out there. Um, again, we are trying to keep it at sort of a basic level. We've uh, had requests to go to like, we have an intro to Microsoft Word and they wanted levels 2, 3, 4, 5, and we feel like some of those are out there in other resources. So uh, we may not move that way with Digital Learn, but we still want to hear your ideas. Great, great. Now we're getting more and more questions coming in. We're just about at the point where we need to move on so we can hear Jessica uh, talk about GCF Learn Free as well. So we'll try to come back to some of these questions at the end. Um, but maybe just one to end on is to go back to that uh, concept of, of uh, customizing the site for your library. Um, and, and people are wondering, is that something that's going to be freely available, or what is it going to take if, there, if libraries are interested in uh, having a custom digital learn site? So the short answer is watch PLA and keep in touch with me to get more information as we roll this out. Um, but we are currently looking for uh, grant funding to be able to roll this out to a number of libraries at no cost. There are some costs involved, and so we're trying to come up with a very um, re manageable, reasonable um, fee for libraries to customize the site. But we've also heard from a few libraries that have ideas that tie into their local initiatives that would require even more customization. And we're really willing to do that, but we need to have those discussions to figure out what it would take to make that happen. All right. All right. Well, that's a good short answer for now. And uh, Scott, we'll see if we can come back and answer some more of these questions at the end of the session. Um, but right now it's time for us to move on. So I'll say thank you for sharing everything you've shared so far. We really appreciate it. All right. Uh, and then so we're, we're going to move in and hear about gcflearnfree.org. And again, we just would like to know prior to today's webinar, is this a resource you were familiar with? Uh, you know, again, tell us, have you used it before the resource? Were you familiar with it but never used it? Or is this an entirely new resource for you? And again, once you uh, select your response and submit it, you'll be able to see what everyone else in the room is saying. And again, we can see this is a, a, a little bit more awareness than when we saw Digital Learn, but still a, a large majority of you are uh, learning about this resource for the first time. So again, thank you for coming to the webinar today and, and taking this opportunity to learn about it. If it's something you are already familiar with, again, we hope you get some new ideas on how to use it. So stay tuned for some of those uh, ideas from libraries uh, which Jessica will share towards the end of her session section. I'm going to close the poll now. It looks like we are getting most of the responses in at this point. So I'm going to close that poll in 3, 2, and 1. And there are our final results from the poll. And then I'm going to transition and hand the controls over to Jessica who's going to tell us all about gcflearnfree.org. Jessica? Thank you, Crystal, and thank you for inviting me uh, to talk to everyone about GCF Learn Free. We definitely see some people that haven't heard of GCF Learn Free, got a few that look like they've used it. Um, so even if you have used it before, maybe there will be some new information for you today. Uh, GCF Learn Free is an educational website funded by the Goodwill Industries of Eastern North Carolina. We offer free tutorials in technology, reading, and math. And although I'll obviously focus on digital literacy today, if you weren't aware of our reading, math, or career programs, then those may be also uh, useful topics for your patrons. So I invite you today or at your earliest convenience to go to the website and to look at some of the other things that we offer in addition to digital literacy. Feel free to use anything that you find at the GCF Learn Free site in the service of your educational programs or with the people you serve. And I'll talk in more detail at the end about specific ways you may be able to do that. Uh, as I mentioned, we are a program of the Goodwill Industries of Eastern North Carolina. It's actually the stores here in Eastern North Carolina that make GCF Learn Free possible. I happen to notice um, in the registration list we have uh, people from Pender County, Hoke County, and Wake County on the line today. And so uh, the GCF stores that are in your communities are what make uh, GCF Learn Free possible, not only for people here in Eastern North Carolina, for all around the United States and all around the world. Uh, in 2015, we actually served 21 million learners, and this year we're on track to serve more than 30 million. 
Uh, we recognize that everyone learns differently. Uh, that's why our tutorials offer written lessons, video tutorials, interactives, and informational graphics. It's our hope that our users can find the learning modality that works best for their learning style. All of the uh, information that you'll find at GCS Learn Free is completely self-paced, which means that users are able to work at their own speed at their own time. Uh, we have learners that will maybe look at the site for an answer to a quick question and then never use us again. Or they could, uh, a learner could work sequentially through a, the entirety of the tutorial, re-reviewing content as many times as they need. An account is not required to access any content at GCF Learn Free. But if a user does want to document their progress uh, and maybe be able to demonstrate what they have learned, then creating an, uh, an account is a very simple process, very quick. Uh, once you've created an account, your progress will be tracked. And then you can print off a transcript of your completed tutorials and then show that to a teacher or to an employer. Um, I'm not going to repeat a lot of the same uh, topics that Digital Learn offers. You'll, you'll see here on the page that uh, there's several that Digital Learn also offers. But some additional topics that may be of, of interest to you is that we offer a mouse tutorial, which is a fun interactive for completely new computer users. We were talking about that earlier where maybe someone is, is completely new to using technology. Uh, we have a typing tutorial, which is a highly interactive tutorial that teaches learners to touch type, uh, which is obviously a skill that's necessary for any patron interested into transitioning to maybe an a office type environment. We have internet safety tutorials, internet safety for kids. And then we have lessons on the setup and maintenance of computers, uh, how to set up a Wi-Fi network, what to do if your computer gets a virus, Questions I'm sure that you receive from patrons regularly. That was one of the ones that uh, was mentioned earlier in the poll was that one-on-one -on -one assistance, that, that getting a lot of technology reference questions. And so being able to direct people to GCS Learn Free to answer those questions uh, may be something uh, of use to you. Again, there are some similar topics here that you'll also find at Digital Learn. Uh, these tutorials in our Living in the Online World program uh, tend to focus more on the digital skills we increasingly see uh, in our day-to-day -day lives, things that we need to know to navigate life on a daily basis as technology becomes a larger and larger part of our lives. Uh, so, so interesting topics here that may be of use to you. Uh, again, knowing that you, you get those individual type questions. Uh, how to use iPhone, how to use an iPad or an Android phone. Uh, I know libraries have device days or, or other programs and opportunities where patrons can bring in their devices to get answers. So this may be something that's, that's helpful that may supplement those programs. Topics like using Wikipedia and Craigslist, uh, how to use streaming video services, listening to podcasts, downloading free audiobooks, um, and then additional social media tutorials like YouTube, Instagram, and LinkedIn. Our Microsoft Office tutorials are our most popular tutorials, and this is how most people originally find GCS Learn Free. These are great for getting up to speed with new versions of Microsoft Office and finding out what changes or differences they've made. But it's equally great for someone who's, who's had no or very little experience with Microsoft Office. The tutorials state with, start with the very basics and then take a learner through what we feel are the most common tasks employees will encounter in most offices. These tutorials are not comprehensive, uh, but we feel that they will largely cover the most important skills someone would need to be able to get a job in an office. Uh, we have just added Word, Excel, PowerPoint uh, 2016, and we're currently working on Access 2016, and that should be available by the end of April. Very quickly, I'd just like to showcase a few tutorial topics to give you an idea of what some of our content may look like if you haven't used GCS Learn Free before, and it looked like most of you hadn't. But even if you have used GCS Learn Free, uh, some of the content has changed a little bit in its look and feel, and so this may look a little different to you. I anticipate that this may be a relevant uh, topic for many of your patrons. Our technology buying guide includes computer, smartphone, and tablet buying guides. A uh, lesson on how to choose between a laptop or a tablet to choose which best fits your needs. Information about e-readers, wearable technology, and more. 
Home on Money Tips is a newer tutorial that we recently added in the last year. Some of the topics here that may be of interest to you is how to get a free credit report, how to use PayPal, uh, how to download free eBooks from your local library. Uh, it's tax season, so you might be having a lot of patrons coming in and asking about how they could do their taxes online. And so uh, we have a lesson on that that may prove to be useful for many of your users. Based on the feedback from our learners, we added a Photoshop Basics tutorial a couple of years ago to help a new user with navigating the Photoshop interface and has lessons on some basic tools and tricks. This is not a comprehensive tutorial either, but uh, really would help anybody who's new to Photoshop. We also offer a digital photography tutorial and an image editing tutorial, and that focuses on editing using free or more affordable software, uh, more affordable than Photoshop. Excel Formulas was also created based on learner requests, and it quickly became one of our most popular tutorials. Uh, this is really great for any learner who's interested in increasing their Excel skills. So this is not for a beginner Excel user, but somebody who maybe wants to get a job or get a better job that's going to require these skills. Our tutorial teaches using real life scenarios to help the learner better understand when to put these skills into practice. Now I'd like to briefly discuss a few ways you can use the content at GCS Learn Free within your educational programs or to serve your patrons. Um, we do actually ask that you complete an application to request to use GCS Learn Free content, and I'll, uh, we'll get that link to you in a, a, by, by the end of this session. This is really just so that we have a record of the organizations that use us and the ways that we're using us. Like I said, you don't have to create an account, and so oftentimes we don't know uh, who's using us. And so this is just for my, our information for our records. This is not required. Um, if you do uh, have a very unique uh, use case, we would want that application. Um, just make sure that you're still following our terms of use. Largely, whatever way you'd like to use our content is allowable. The only common use we deny is uh, to copy and paste our content into an LMS, a CMS, a portal, or some kind of closed system. That would be against our terms of use. Uh, you can certainly link to our site. You can embed YouTube videos. You can even iframe our content. Um, but you would not be able to grab our content and then put it inside of your system, uh, unfortunately. Uh, one of the most popular ways that uh, organizations use our content is through traditional in-person classes. It looked like some people, uh, some libraries are, are using that. It was, that was one of the ways that people said they were using digital literacy tutorials. Uh, in this situation, you could use GCS Learn Free in lieu of a textbook. So perhaps it would be maybe your entire curriculum, or maybe just the parts uh, that you need to supplement an existing curriculum. Feel free to use the content from us to create and distribute presentations, handouts, brochures, any other educational materials that you would use within that class. If you do offer traditional classes, uh, you may want to look at our educators' resources for suggestions and best practices for using the content in your class. We'll also provide a link to this as well. Uh, specifically, our curriculum guides offer learning paths, so that will help you make connections within the topics that we offer, and also give you some ideas and suggestions for your learning space. One-on-one -on -one assistance, yes, that's a huge. We know that librarians spend a lot of time assisting patrons one-on-one. -on -one. Um, and GCF Learn Free should certainly be used in, in these instances. Uh, for instance, maybe you have a patron that asks a specific question about Excel. Uh, navigate the patron to that particular lesson at GCF Learn Free. Show them the text, the videos, the, any additional content that maybe will help them in performing that task. Hopefully this would allow you to then be available to assist other patrons. And it empowers that learner to then take ownership of their learning. Uh, it really allows them to learn at their own pace, and so they don't feel rushed or embarrassed about not getting it. They don't feel pressured that you're sitting there next to them. Um, and so this, this is certainly a resource uh, that you could use in those instances. Another way was resource links. I think that was one that was in the poll. And for libraries that have websites that offer a list of helpful resources, feel free to add GCS Learn Free to that list. Uh, we also have flyers available. Uh, you can print those off, distribute to uh, your patrons, post uh, around your library. Again, we'll post a link to that as well. 
Um, some libraries will even put a shortcut uh, to the GCF Learn Free site on maybe their computer lab desktop. Honestly, any way that you'd like to spread the word about GCF Learn Free in the way that you think it makes the most sense for your patrons, uh, we are certainly okay with it. I think this is one thing we don't think about very often, but GCF Learn Free isn't only for the end user. It's not only for your patrons. It's not for the people that you serve. It's for us too. Uh, technology changes so quickly, and even the most tech savvy person can't know everything there is to know. Uh, maybe when your library upgrades to the newest version of Microsoft Office, when you transition from Windows 7 to Windows 10, um, the tutorials at GCF Learn Free may help you get up to speed with anything you need to know. Uh, we work very hard to keep our site up to date, and when there are changes to technology, we hope that you'll think of us as a resource. We have thousands of organizations of all types uh, that use us in a thousand different ways. I'm not going to go into great detail about each of these particular examples, but one unique story from this slide is Santo Domingo Pueblo Library. We worked with them to provide them a downloadable version of our site, which they then translated into a language used uh, by one of the local tribes. This may be relevant for some of you, and I think that's, that was some of the questions we received earlier. Uh, if you work with ESL students or other populations who speak languages other than English, please reach out to us and contact us about translation opportunities. Uh, currently, we do offer Spanish and Portuguese tutorials through our sister sites, gcfaprendelibre.org, and gcfaprendelivre.org. We'll pass those links out to you in a moment. Uh, these are not direct translations of the tutorials you would find at GCF Learn Free. They're actually created by a team in Bogota, Colombia. But their focus is also on technology, reading, and math. You'll see many of the same topics. And that still may be helpful information for you for any learners that you may have whose primary language is Spanish or Portuguese. Uh, I did see that we had a few academic libraries signed up today, and, and that's, we're seeing a lot of community colleges, a lot of four-year colleges who are using uh, GCF Learn Free to help their non-traditional students kind of get up to speed, uh, to teach the technology skills the students need to be successful as they return to school. So I'd like to encourage you to consider different types of populations that may be served by GCF Learn Free and Digital Learn. Uh, it could be school-aged children, young adults preparing for the workforce for the first time, adults returning to the workforce after some time out, older adults who want to learn more about technology, and even adults who are already tech savvy but still need to keep up with the latest changes. Uh, I did mention the downloadable site a few minutes ago, and I just wanted to let you know that if you're in an area that has no internet, unreliable internet, if uh, YouTube is blocked in your library, we can provide you with a version of our site that works offline. Uh, this version is created about every other year, and therefore it doesn't have the newer content after it's created. So this is definitely not a replacement for the online site. The live site is always going to be the preferable version if you can access it. But those that don't have the option, the downloadable site is a great substitute. It's been a, a huge success in rural areas of the United States developing countries around the world, and we're huge in prisons. Uh, we're actually on tablets owned by every Georgia inmate. Uh, so if this applies to you, or if you ever have any questions or comments, even after today's webinar, please, please contact me anytime. Uh, that is all of the uh, content that I had to share with you today, but I, I'm, I'd love to hear your questions or any of your comments. Great. Uh, Jessica, thank you for sharing such detailed information about what uh, GCF Learn Free has to offer. And we are getting some questions in, and I'm sure we'll you know, please send us questions if you have them. Um, we do have time for questions uh, right now, and, and I think we'll bring Scott back on in a minute. Uh, one of the first questions I've seen come in, uh, Jessica, is just about uh, one of the topics you have available. I know you have a lot of Microsoft uh, training. Do you have training for Office 365 available? That's an excellent question. The uh, Office 365, we're, we actually work with Microsoft Office. Um, they are aware that we create tutorials. When you search for Microsoft Office tutorials, we come up above their own support. Um, and so moving forward, they are going to stop doing versioning. Uh, if you look at our 2016, there aren't any references to the dates. 
Um, Office 2016 mirrors Office 365, the online version. So if you are using Office 365, the 2016 tutorials should help you with 99% of your questions there. If there are slight differences, um, it's because 365 is going to start being continuously updated. Um, and then moving forward, most likely it's going to be all Office 365 instead of uh, every three-year versioning. All right. Well, that's uh, some good insider information there to know about uh, the relationship between those two as well because I think we don't always realize that, uh, that similarity. So that's great to know. Um, now another question that we got in was um, if uh, was asking is GCF Learn Free uh, mobile device friendly? And the context there is that they have a lot of students who use tablets, and they were thinking this could be beneficial for them if they worked on it on their tablets instead of on a desktop or laptop computer. Uh, most tablets should be fine that screen size. Uh, we are working to better optimize our site for smaller screen sizes, more you know phone size. A tablet size should work. I will say that we do have some of our older programs that still require Flash. Um, our reading program, our adult literacy program, our mouse tutorial, our everyday life program still operates in Flash. But moving forward, everything is in HTML5, the typing tutorial, um, some other interactives. And so uh, if you do have an iPad, you may run into some Flash barriers. Uh, but otherwise, everything should be mobile optimized for using a tablet, and you should still be able to access most content. Excellent. And is it just through the mobile website, or do you have an app available? Uh, it, it would just be uh, a um, responsive design working. Great. So there's not a separate app, or there's not a separate M dot, or anything like that. It would just render to be optimized on that screen. Great. Great. And actually, Scott, I think this is a question that also came up for uh, Digital Learn. So uh, in terms of accessing this on mobile devices, tablets uh, in particular, uh, is Digital Learn compatible with that? Uh, we've tried to make most of the courses compatible with that. Some, as I mentioned earlier, just really don't translate if it's about um, how to use a mouse and things like that. But we, that is something that's on our list to, to try and improve. Great. And, and same question about app availability. Is it just if you're on a tablet, would you just go to the Digital Learn website, or do you have an app available? We we do not have an app available at this point. Right. All right. Um, well, I'm just uh, taking a look to see if we're getting any new questions in. It looks like um, we've tried to answer as many of the questions as we could from earlier. Um, and uh, well, here's one question I can actually ask to both of you. Nicole asks if the courses involve practice files or hands-on activities. And I know you've both touched on that, but maybe just now you could summarize by saying what's the level of hands-on activity and also what uh, files are included. And Scott, I'll have you take this one first since I know this came in during uh, your, your section. Sure. Um, the courses as we built them initially didn't include a lot of hands-on activity or practice um, direction. Uh, partly because we didn't have a way to support and, and monitor that. Uh, what the partnership with Chicago Public Library is allowing us to do though is build in some exercises for users to do, and the staff in the library are able to then help them finish those or um, verify that it was completed or respond if a response is necessary to the learner. So um, I guess the, the short answer is really there aren't a lot of those, but they are being built as we expand out this year. Right, right. And you also have some print materials that come out along with the courses, correct? Yeah, the, the entire course transcript is available to uh, download great. and save or print. Great, great. And then Jessica, I know you did touch on this, but can you just uh, summarize again what type of hands-on activities you have available? Uh, it would vary from tutorial to tutorial. Some are more in-depth than others. For instance, our Microsoft Office tutorials would offer you a practice document that you could work along with the video, with the lesson. There's a challenge at the end where the learner is prompted to try to make changes per, you know, to the document and, and try to get some hands-on learning. Uh, but that's pretty deep for our tutorials. Most would have interactives, maybe a quiz at the end. Um, practice documents where relevant, but we do do try to uh, respond to all different types of learning modalities. Great, great. 
Um, and then also just, just to clarify, we got this question earlier and I think it's come up, but just to clarify, libraries are able to link their, from their website to both of your resources, uh, and, and tell me if I'm wrong here, but um, it, it's, it's free for any library or any nonprofit to link to the resources and uh, uh, recommend that their users go visit digitallearn.org and gcflearnfree.org. Do I have that correct, Scott? Um, definitely, and actually I for neglected to mention this, but I'd like to add it now. Not only is it free and we encourage it, but um, the files that we use to develop the site are open source and, and available if a library wants to take them and use them and, and customize them or use them for their own purposes. So um, we really just want to get this out there. Excellent. And Jessica? Yeah, absolutely. We, we certainly encourage anyone to, to link uh, to use GCF Learn Free in whatever way they, they think may be best. Um, everything that you find at GCF Learn Free uh, is free to use, free to the learner, um, and then they definitely don't you know, encourage people to use it at home or when they're not at the library. They can access it anywhere they have an Internet connection. Great, great. Um, and then to follow up on that, we got a great question just now from John that says, do you refer users to other resources from within your sites? Um, and I know, uh, Scott, you mentioned the custom resources that libraries could put in, but does Digital Learn refer out to other resources at all? Um, no, and actually that's, that? a, that's a great question and, and something that I think until we started working with specific libraries to personalize it, we, we didn't have that feature built in. But um, we, we do expect that as we build out these personalized sites, libraries will then want to direct users to whatever you know, other resources that they're comfortable with. But right now we really don't direct users to a lot of other sites. Yeah, and certainly in, in the situation you described, being able to refer people to local resources is a great benefit there. Um, and, and, uh, and then Jessica, on GCF Learn Free's side, do you have any resources you refer people out to? Um, I'm going to post our great big gigantic list of free resources that we have found it's within our educators resources area. Um, and so it's just a, a great curated list of free resources that we think are, are good and, and may be relevant for different educators, different librarians. Um, and then throughout peppered throughout the site if, if it's relevant, um, we certainly link to Microsoft, Google, Apple, things like that. Um, but then other uh, resources, people where we think are doing really great things in uh, technology basics, Internet safety, we certainly link to them as well. Excellent, excellent. And so all of the links that, uh, that Jessica and Scott have shared today we will include in the archive email that will be going out by the end of the week. You'll also have access to the slides. They've put their email addresses in the slides and have invited you to reach out to them if, if you have uh, further questions. And if we didn't respond to your question during the webinar today, I know there were a few we didn't get to, we will follow up with you via email later on so um, that you'll be getting that within the next week. Um, so thank you for um, uh, Scott and and Jessica for sharing all of this information today. I just have a few announcements. If you'll all stay on the line uh, for a few more minutes, we have a survey at the end. You can tell us what you thought of today's webinar. Uh, but first, just a couple of announcements before we wrap up. I wanted to make sure you know about some upcoming uh, TechSoup for Libraries and TechSoup webinars. Um, coming up on March 29th, uh, we have our TechSoup uh, Tuesday tour, uh, so you can learn more about what TechSoup has to offer at that if you're interested. And, um, and then we have two libraries webinars coming up. On on Wednesday, April 27th, we have one on Instagram for public libraries. That should be a lot of fun. And then on Wednesday, uh, May 4th, we have one on outcome measurement for public libraries. And we'll be looking especially at smaller and rural libraries in that webinar. So mark your calendars and stay tuned on our webinar and events page uh, for registration details on those if you're interested. Um, also, uh, if you haven't been to TechSoupForLibraries.org in a while, please take a look at that website. We've recently gotten a little bit of a makeover on the website there. But TechSoup for Libraries collects stories about libraries, uh, how uh, libraries are utilizing technology, and we share them via the blog, and we also share them on webinars like this one. And so you can read more about uh, other libraries' experiences there. Also, if you have a story to share, uh, you can submit your story there, um, and we would love to certainly love to hear from you. So please do stay in touch and um, visit TechSoup for libraries.org for more. Um, thanks also to our webinar sponsor today, ReadyTalk. Uh, once again, stay on the line please for just a brief sur survey. Thanks Scott and Jessica for sharing what their expertise in, is in uh, digital literacy training resources. And thank you for joining us today. We hope you have a great afternoon. Bye-bye. <laughs>